Hey guys, it's Davin here at Brewbits.com. Hi the camera, we've got James as normal. Say hello James. <laughs> so, if you haven't watched the last two videos of blackberries and uh, black currants, then you won't know that I was told this morning I had to clear the freezer out of all my fruit. So I've got uh, red currants, blackberries, black currants, I've got grapes. There's a few other things in there I was told to get rid of as well. Anyway, so I thought we would brew it up. And I know we've done a red currant video already, but I thought I would show you a quick and easy way to brew up a red currant wine and get it in the bottles so you can drink it a little bit quicker. So in here, I've got lots and lots and lots of red currants. You can see they've been frozen. They're going lovely and mushy. So I've got my red currants and I've got them already in a bucket, but you're going to need a second bucket. You need some sugar, you need some yeast, and here I'm using CY17, and this is a um, Mangrove Jack's wine yeast. Really good for things like Zinfandel roses and stuff like that, which is gonna be great because this is gonna be a rose wine. We're also gonna speed the process up at the end by using some fermentation stopper and some finings. We'll also need some Camden tablets, and right at the beginning, we're also gonna need some Pectolase as well. We've got a spoon for stirring everything around, We've got a mashing and sparging bag here, and that's so that we can strain all the fruit out in a little bit. And we've also over here got a thermometer and a hydrometer in my trial jar. So, I've got a weird amount of fruit here because I've saved it up over a couple of years and it's just been going in the freezer. So I've got 4.5, just over 4.5 kilos of fruit. That's about nine, just under 10 pound of fruit. So I'm gonna to need to put uh, about three and three quarter kilos of sugar um, and just over 11 liters of water. Um, but if you're making this at home and you wanna make it a standard one, one gallon batch, that's 4.5 liters, then you're gonna need three pound of fruit, two and a half pound of sugar and uh, six pints of water. If you want that metric, that is 1.36 kilos of fruit 1.13 kilos of sugar and oh, 3.4 liters of water. All of that, if you've missed it, is down in the notes down below so you can catch all of that. And of course the recipes will be on the website as well. Right, now we've got all of this, I think it's time to get brewing. So I have got myself 3.78 kilos of sugar. It looks a lot, but, it's not. So that's just going to pour straight in on top of my currants. Now, my currants have been in the freezer, so they're pretty cold. So I'm going to put the kettle on and boil up a couple of pints of water. Oh, I think I said pints in the last one. I meant litres, so for me, I'm putting in two litres into my berries so that I can mix this up. You're just going to use, if you're making a gallon batch, you're just going to use two pints of boiling water. So I'm going to stir this now until all my sugars dissolve. You can see the lovely colour coming out of that already. Isn't that gorgeous? Beautiful. Now all that sugar is dissolved. We're going to top it up with our cold tap water. I've added all the water and given it a good stir to make sure it's all thoroughly mixed around. Look at that colour. Now come on down here James because I've already taken a small amount in a glass because we're going to now add our pectolase. And for my lot here I need to add three teaspoons in. Two, three, oh, sugar. And we're going to give it a good stir and get that dissolved. So back to me a second, James, because pectolase, what that's going to do, is going to do two things. Because we used a bit of boiling water on the fruit, it's going to have released some pectin. And pectin in a finished wine uh, annoyingly creates a horrible haze. So the pectolase that we've just added in here, that's going to break down that haze. Now the way it does it is by breaking down the cell walls. 
That's brilliant for us because pectolase breaks down the cell walls of fruit. I'm going to give this a good stir and I've added it in. So what it's also going to do in here now is the pectolase in here is going to start working on the fruit in there. It's going to start breaking down the cell walls and splitting them open. And of course, as it does that, that means it's going to release its colour. And yes, it's already a great red um, fruity colour. It's going to get even lusher. But it's also going to help the cells break down so that they release all those extra lovely red currant flavours. I've taken a sample with my hydrometer and it's currently coming out at 1.096, which is really, really high. There's a reason for that. We've kind of scrimped on the water because inside these berries, let me just pick one out, there is a load of juice. And as these berries break down, they're now gonna release that juice into our water. And they're gonna add their own amount of water to this. So, it's kind of a little bit of a false reading at the moment. I'm going to take my CY17 yeast, but before I do that, I'm going to take a quick check of the temperature with my thermometer. I did this a few seconds ago before I added the pectolase, but I thought I'd better do it on camera so you see it as well. And it's coming out at just over 20 degrees C, so it tells us it's safe for us to add our yeast. Now this yeast here has also got the nutrient in it, so it's going to help create, make a lovely, really fruity wine. And it's brilliant for things like this. So, in that goes. We're going to give it a little stir in just to help get it mixed in so it doesn't just sit on the top of the fruit. And the big thing here is because we're fermenting with the fruit, we need to, back to me a second, James. Because we're fermenting with the fruit, we need to have a bucket with a lot of headspace. So, because this fruit's gonna um, get lots and lots of carbon dioxide stuck in it, and it's gonna float to the top, and it's gonna bubble around. And if we didn't have all this headspace, it will potentially overflow. Right, so what am I doing with this? Well, I don't know what I've done with the lid, but I'm gonna find the lid in a moment. The lid's gonna go on loosely, and this is gonna go into my warm cupboard, at 18 to 22 degrees C for seven days, possibly 10, seven to 10 days to fully ferment out. My red currant wine has been in my warm cupboard now for 10 days, and I've taken a sample with my trial jar, and it's coming out at 0.996. Come on in, James, and have a look at this, because all those gorgeous red currants have floated to the top. They've all popped and let all their juice out and they've transferred all their lovely colour into the wine. But we've still got loads and loads of currants in there, so we need to uh, get the currants out. So down here, I've got a sterilised bucket, which I've rinsed out. Sorry, I had a little bit of water left in the bottom, so I got rid of that. And I've also got myself a sterilised uh, mashing and sparging bag. And the reason why we got that is because that can go on nicely over the top of this second bucket. And it's got a pull cord, and as you can see, I can tie it into a Bow. Okay, now this machine in sparging bag's got um, two grains or uh, two uh, grades of mesh. You've got really fine mesh and really coarse mesh, and this really helps with getting the um, juice out of these cans. Now, all I'm going to simply do, very very carefully, do the old-fashioned method of pouring it. Including all the gunk at the bottom as well. All right, we don't want to waste this either, do you? Actually, I'm going to need that in a moment, so I'm not going to pour that in just yet. Right, so I'm going to undo my bow and I'm going to lift all my currants up. Quite heavy at the moment because they've still got a lot of juice in. And as you lift them up, they start to run naturally. You can give it a little squeeze. Don't try and squeeze from the top, put your hand underneath and gently, what you're gonna do is just massage the bag from underneath. And you'll very, very quickly find 
that all the juice starts to empty out. You can give it a turn so you can get a bit more tightness on it. Now, earlier on, I said our hydrometer reading was going to be a little bit false. And that's because we were a little bit short on the water. Now, all of those berries have released all their lovely juice into our wine. Well, I can keep on squeezing, but I think that is going to be about what I'm going to get out of there. So let's get rid of that. So I could have kept, we could have added extra water, but all that lovely juice has come out of the berries. And now we've got ooh, like three and a half gallons in there. Excellent. Right, I'm going to wash my hands a second. So we now need to add our fermentation stopper. And this is going to kill all of our, any yeast that uh, is still living in here. So we've got uh, about 16 and a half litres, less all the sediment. I reckon we're gonna have about three good gallons. So this is half a teaspoon of potassium sorbate per gallon. So one, two, three. And this is why I didn't pour this back in because this, well, this comes in handy. So that pours in like that. That's going to allow us now to dissolve the potassium sorbate straight away so that we can then add this into here and give it a good stir. And this gets it going that little bit quicker. Right, so that the potassium sorbate can work as good as it can, we're also now going to add our Camden tablets. We need to add a Camden tablet per gallon. So we're going to use three Camden tablets. And the easiest way I find these is to grab yourself two dessert spoons, pop your Camden tablets on one dessert spoon, pop the other on top and on the countertop, just wiggle and wiggle and wiggle. Ooh, we got a little pop out there. I'll get that one back in a moment. And then we got our three Camden tablets crushed. And that goes in as well. Ooh, let's get it let's off the top of there, what's off the bottom of there. Give it a good stir in. Okay, so this stir here, although we're now incorporating all the potassium sorbate and the sodium metabisulfate, the Camden tablets, Inside this wine is a lot of dissolved carbon dioxide. And so that when we get to the clearing stage, to make clearing a lot faster, we need to knock all that carbon dioxide out. So whilst it's in there, we're now gonna give it a really good thorough stirring for a good minute. You can see it's starting to knock some of the carbon dioxide out. Now we're gonna to need to do this for a minute. I'm gonna to need to do this three times per day over the next two days to make sure all the potassium sorbate, all the fermentation stoppers worked beautifully and killed off all the yeast. But also, so we've knocked all that uh, carbon dioxide out. So over the next two days, pop the lid off, give it a good stir for a full minute, pop the lid back on, and get on about with what you'd normally do from day. I've been stirring the red currant wine vigorously three times a day for the last 48 hours and I've left it for a good few hours whilst I got myself ready to do this video. And come on and have a look at this James because you'll notice it started to clear. It's already dropping out of uh, suspension already. So what I thought instead of disturbing all the sediment at the bottom of here now, here I've got a sterilised bucket and in here I've got a sterilised siphon. There's a little bit of water left in this. That's uh, the water where I swirled it out. And there might be a little bit of water left in that one. No. Nope. So, I'm going to siphon it into this bucket here. Come on in James and have a look at the wine now because I've siphoned it into the bucket and lifted it up onto the top and I thought it would be 
naughty not to take a sample. Now it looks really, really clear, but I can assure you there is still some sediment in that. Um, so we're gonna be using some findings, but I'm not gonna pour this back in. I think it's gonna be good. It's lovely. It's got a nice little sharpness to it. Loads and loads and loads of fruitiness. That is gonna be nice. Right, so the findings I'm using here is a clear findings, and this is based with two bottles. It's going to go down here, James. So bottle A and bottle B. Bottle A is a silicon-based um, findings called Kiesel Sol, and bottle B in this instance is a gelatin-based findings. So the way we do this is on the back of the clear it box, it'll say how much sediment do you think left in here? Um, and you're gonna put in based on what you think the sediment amount is. And I think it's quite a low sediment. So therefore, in goes a syringe. I've got a little syringe here that does milliliters. And I'm gonna pull off one mil. And I'm literally gonna pop that in there like so. Well, I'll put the top on the bottle and grab my spoon. Because I know one mil doesn't sound like very much, but remember what we're trying to do here is just trying to use findings A to grab hold of any particles that are floating around in the wine, grab hold of them, stick them all together, uh, and cause them to clump up and drop out of suspension, drop to the bottom of the bucket. And that's all we're trying to do here. So give it a good stir. Make sure A is all thoroughly mixed in. And I did think about leaving my spoon in there then and I thought, nah, with the depth of that, I'd have lost my spoon. Pop the top on and we're going to leave this now for one hour for findings A to start to work. It's been an hour since we added our finings A to the red currant wine. So now it's time to add finings B. And we're going to use the same amount here. Now, if you're not using clear it, there's lots and lots of other different types of finings out there. Um, there's similar based ones. There's um, ones that are based on Isinglass, which are the swim bladders of fish. Read the instructions on it. Find out which ones you're going to use, how you're going to use it, and then pop it in, give it a good stir. Get it all mixed in. Pop the lid on. And now this, for me, needs to go somewhere cool, and I need to leave it for about 48 to 72 hours, so two to three days, for it to take effect. Grab all those particles that are floating around in there, make them all clump together and drop to the bottom. The red currant wine has been sat here now for the last 48 hours. Come on in and have a look at this James Cup. This is really clear, so much so that you can see my fingers through the wine and through the bucket. So I've noticed that there is a small amount of sediment uh, lying down at the bottom here. So we know the findings, although it looked quite clear previously, has done its work. So down here, I've got a, another bucket which I've sterilised and I've got my simple siphon that I've sterilised as well. So in the top of the... Quite hard to speak when you're doing that. In the top of the siphon goes, or in the siphon goes into the top of the top wine, give a good suck and down into the bottom of the bottom wine. Now I know I said there wasn't going to be much sediment, that's about all I'm going to get out there, but what's left in the bottom of the bucket Actually, can we have a look? Have a good look at this, James. If I swirl that around, you'll see this. There's quite a bit of sediment still left in there. So the findings have done their work absolutely brilliantly. Right, so I no longer need my siphon or that bucket, so let's get rid of that. And this, oh, you see my two little egg cups that I used to prop the side of my bucket up. All right, I'm just gonna pop a lid on for that for now. And I've prepared my bottles here already. Um, I've uh, sterilized them and then rinsed them out. 
but it's always good to take a quick little cheeky taster. That's really, really nice. The findings have really helped to, to lift it. It's got a good, nice acidity to it. It's nice and smooth, really unbelievably fruity. Loads and loads and loads of forest fruits. You wouldn't believe that that's just red currant. That is an amazing fruity rosé wine. That is delicious. But now I need to clean my siphon and I need to get it ready for the bottles. With my siphon, it's got a sediment trap on the end, this little baby. We don't need that anymore because we know there's no sediment in the bottom. We also could do with a tap on the end and I'm also going to grab my bucket clip, clip that on the tube like that. And that simply sits down inside the bucket and it means I've got this end fully free. Now, I know you've seen me doing sucking on the end of this tube and you might be going, oh, it's really unhygienic, we've done all this sterilization. Okay, well, yeah, alcohol in here is actually gonna kill any bugs that my lips may be putting around the end. If you didn't want to do it with a simple siphon and sucking it, we do have auto siphons where you can pop it in the wine, pump it, and it will prime the pipe for you. So, I've now primed my pipe. Ooh, where misses. And here I've got my uh, bottles that I've sterilized already. And come on along, James, because I'm gonna run the wine down the inside of the bottle so it doesn't splash. This helps prevent any infections. And we're gonna fill it up to uh, about there, really. So we've got enough space for the corks and a tiny little layer of space as well. Keep an eye on it, it doesn't take long to fill it up. And if you don't keep an eye on it and somebody distracts you, you can very easily end up with lots and lots and lots of wine everywhere. Right, that is our first bottle. Look at that, doesn't that look great? Okay, I've got a few more to go. So we've got all our bottles filled. I've got all the lovely clear bottles. Those will be the nice pretty ones that we put a lovely label on. And then we've got some more odds and sods bottles because we didn't have enough bottles. Anyway. Now it's time for corking. So I've got my corker, I've got my tongs. Why have I got tongs? Well, it's because over here, I've got a little saucepan. Don't get too close, James, because this is uh, a, a sterilizing liquid in the bottom there. And I've put that uh, sodium metabisulfate, put that on to boil. And then as soon as it started boiling, I dropped my amount of corks that I needed into it. I left them in there now for about a minute and that sterilizes them and also softens them slightly so they really go um, really easily into the bottles. So now it's off the heat, just basically keeping the heat in them and just fire through your bottles. Right, I've got a few to do. I finished putting the corks in the bottles and oh no, got a little bit left over. <laughs> That's going to be safe for after we finish doing this filming. But for now, the corks are in. I'll uh, make some nice pretty labels on this. I'll probably put a shrink wrap over the top. But look at that colour. Isn't it amazing? So, what happens now? Well, we need to leave these stood up for the next 24 hours to allow the corks to set into place. And then we need to lay them down somewhere nice and cool so that they can condition in the bottle. Now, I can tell you from the taste of this, it's not going to take them long. They're really zingy, they're really fresh, they're really, really nice as they are. I'm going to probably lay them down for about three months before I pop these open. Uh, so it's going to be just in the middle of winter. You can chill them down and have them nice and cool like a rosé. Or, I think it's actually quite nice, straight room temperature. Okay, so that's as easy as that. That's how you make red currant wine. And uh, you can see how many bottles I've got here. All you've got to do is just save your red currants up. And uh, all you've got to do is make some more. Down in the comments below, let me know how you get on, um, how your wines turn out, how enjoyable they are, did you get the right colour? And of course, if you need any to ask any questions, need any help, need any guidance, and feel free to either get in touch through the website or send some comments down below. And uh, that 
Anyway, for now, happy brewing. Cheers and enjoy some red currant wine. <laughs>